All right, uh, uh, some announcements here. Um, uh, one is uh, Praxis is uh, sponsoring Dr. Benjamin Powell, who will be here on Wednesday evening, the day of the midterm, but Wednesday evening uh, in Dow B. And that's going to be at 7 p.m. Um, so. at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, and uh, he's, he's speaking on his new book co-authored with Dr. Robert Lawson, and the title is Socialism Sucks, Two Economists Drink Their Way Through the Unfree World. Um, so I've not read the book, but the title is obviously fairly interesting. So uh, anyway, if you, uh, you know, if you get a chance, uh, you might stop by uh, Dow B. Uh, at 7 p.m. If you know of anybody that is a senior uh, economics major, um, there's an exit exam Wednesday as well at 6:15, which will be over in time to go to the uh, to go to the uh, Benjamin Powell lecture, and that's in this room, Lane 337. So if you know somebody that's a senior econ major, you might alert them to the uh, exit exam that they're supposed to go to. And then finally, um, the, uh, our public relations, media and public relations uh, folks um, have discovered that the Wall Street Journal has a blog that they were hoping that um, some of our students might write into. It's called Future View, and it is for college students to send uh, their comments on a particular topic. Um, uh, she sent me one that was, uh, the, the, the topic was, is the campus free speech crisis overblown? Um, so evidently they have uh, different topics. Uh, and if you're interested, then uh, you can try Future View uh, on the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and if you have trouble trying to figure this out, Emily Davis is the person to contact in the media and public relations if you're interested in uh, sending something into the Wall Street Journal's uh, future view. <coughs> All right. Uh, again, uh, don't forget that the exam is, uh, is Wednesday. I should be in the office most of tomorrow, probably in the office this afternoon as well. Uh, so uh, if you have any problems working your way through some of the old uh, exam questions, you know, just uh, feel, free to, feel free to stop in. All right. Um, so last time we were discussing that uh, what happens when uh, governments engage in legalized plunder, what Bastiat was saying. Uh, again, he uh, is fairly stream of consciousness, uh, but he either, you know, if you read through, you sort of pick up, uh, at least four things that he talks about. He says, one is that the plundered classes will attempt to engage in the making of the law by violent or other means. He says that we'll lose our sense of what's just and unjust, that is, we won't recognize Social Security as taking from one person and <clears throat> giving to another. He says, political conflicts will become the, <clears throat> excuse me, the order of the day, so that uh, we will see uh, everything as a, as a political conflict because the government's doing so much that it's going to be involved in uh, how the uh, it's going to be involved in how many miles your car gets and uh, what can be on a pizza and how much your soda can you know soda cup you can have biggest soda cup you can have and so political conflicts become the order of the day um, and then he says that people are going to blame the government when it can't accomplish the stuff that it says it can so you guys are now going to start expecting the government to be able to provide uh, free college education for everybody. Um, and of course, how's, you know, how's that possibly gonna work? You know, where there's an opportunity cost of resources. Uh, are we now going to have much larger schools uh, or are we gonna have more schools? Uh, and if so, how's that gonna get paid for? Uh, you guys aren't gonna pay tuition, so are somehow the schools supposed to just voluntarily uh, produce these public, you know, this free public education, or is the government going to tax people in order to pay for the college? 
uh, how's that all going to work, right? So the it, government can't accomplish this, but you guys will blame government when it can't, right? When when it turns out that government can't possibly give free public education to everybody, free 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 college education to everybody, then what will happen? You guys will, will blame the government for not being able to do what it, it said it would. Um, and then we close with, with a couple uh, points that he says, uh, this distinguishing between what's legal versus what's legitimate. Uh, we noted that Mises says that if you're going to be free, you just have to figure out that some people are going to do stuff that you don't want them to do, right? That you, you can't use the law. He says people are, are, are free to live abstemiously, but you can't, if you don't persuade other people not to do what you want them not to do, then you can't use the government to go out and force them to do it because you just weren't persuasive enough. Best Jot's saying something very similar here, that if the law is going to only protect life, liberty, and property, there's going to be lots of things that are going to be legal that you might not consider legitimate. Uh, and again, uh, your, your uh, role should be, if you don't want people to do such things, then you need to persuade them uh, as to why they, why they shouldn't do that or why they should do the things that they're not doing. And then we close with this that he pointed out, just as Mises pointed out that in 1927 that we're going to have the Great Depression, we're going to have World War II, the fast is going to start World War II, prohibition isn't going to work, uh, et cetera. Bastiat is foreshadowing or, or, or uh, predicting what? That the, the Civil War is going to happen in the United States. Um, and he says, just as Mises said, what's going to cause all these things is anti-liberal thought, right? Bastiat says what's going to cause this is that the government is engaged in legalized plunder. He says the, that the United States is the country that best kept within its bounds other than slavery and tariffs. And that could lead to ruination of the Union. Eleven years later, what happens is we have the Civil War over slavery and terror. So uh, again, but why is this happening? It's, it's happening because government's being engaged in legalized plunder. That's, that's, that's why it's going to happen. So uh, again, I mentioned that uh, Bastiat's uh, very stream of consciousness in his uh, discussion. So then, after he's had this whole long discussion, he defines what legalized plunder is. You know, he says, how can we recognize... How can we recognize legalized plunder? And basically, there, there are two things. One, we've sort of already emphasized, and that is the law take from one person and give to another. Does the law take from one person and give to another? So this morning I was watching uh, Squawk Box, which is the CNBC thing on investing and stuff, and they're interviewing uh, Warren Buffett, right? Uh, and they ask him about um, uh, this particular stock and why this other guy is selling the stock. Uh, and he says, well, he only had the, the, this other guy says he only has $14 billion under management. And so what he wants to uh, buy one stock, he has to sell another stock. And I have enough that, you know, we have cash on hand. So Warren Buffett, pretty wealthy, right? I've never said, oh, they only have $14 billion that they're managing, okay? Um, so what happens? Warren Buffett still gets Social Security, right? Um, and, and so that is legalized plunder, right? You guys are paying 12.4% of everything that you earn, you're paying it into the federal government, so what? So we can give it to Warren Buffett. Um, and uh, again, we will lose our sense of what's just and unjust, but, but nonetheless, what's, what the point is, what is legalized plunder? If the law is taken from one person and giving to another, that's legalized plunder. But the second thing he says is, does it give one person an advantage over another? as its purpose, right, is, is the reason for it to give one person an advantage over another. Now, clearly laws, you know, there's lots of laws that will give somebody a, an advantage over another, but is the purpose of the law to give 
a person, one person advantage over the other. And what he's really talking about here is tariffs uh, and regulation. Right? If I am the uh, steel industry uh, in the United States and I get you to pass a law that says anybody that buys Chinese steel has to pay a tax, what's that going to do? It's going to increase the price of Chinese steel and U.S. steel then is a, uh, is a substitute for Chinese steel that's going to shift the demand curve for U.S. steel to the right and drive up the price of U.S. steel and selling more U.S. steel. So the purpose, if, if what the, you know, the, if the purpose of the tariff is to advantage U.S. steel manufacturers, then that would be legalized plunder. Um, if there was a regulation that required you to uh, use electric cars uh, to give an advantage of uh, Tesla over General Motors, or General Motors now it's sort of got electric cars, but uh, let's say over Chrysler, um, if that was the if that was the purpose of the law, then that would be legalized plunder. Um, so it's not just does it take from one person to give to another, but also uh, is the purpose of the law to advantage uh, one person over another. Um, so I just came across uh, this was on February fourth. Um, Don Boudreau, who's the um, the chairman of uh, the uh, economics department at George Mason University. Um, he also has a, uh, a blog called Cafe Hayek that has a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things on it. That's just big, using basic uh, Econ 105 level of economics to analyze uh, different uh, situations. Um, but this he was writing uh, to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and it's about steel tariffs, um, and he says that um, there is uh, one industry unmentioned by Mr. Trump that his tariffs are reviving, the rent-seeking industry. I mean, if you take Econ 402, we talk about rent-seeking, which is really where the government is, uh, when, when people are using the government in order to give themselves uh, increased profit. Uh, and so he says... Um, uh, as, as the administration uh, works to give uh, Uncle Sam greater discretion in doling out protection from foreign competition, businesses will spend much more time and resources uh, uh, getting uh, favors from the people on the Potomac. Uh, many more producers will plead for higher tariffs, while many others will plead for relief from the costs of disruptions inevitably created by these tariffs. Entrepreneurs and executive energies will be diverted from competing in the market for dollars opened by consumers to competing in Washington for special privileges dispensed by government officials. Okay, so that's exactly what you know Bastiat said, right? He says once the government engages in legalized plunder, the plundered classes will attempt to engage in the making of the law. So uh, uh, Don Boudreau's uh, uh, letter to the editor of the Wall Street Journal. I mean, that's he's just pointing out what Bastiat pointed out. Uh, in 1850, um, then he says that uh, the law he says the law cannot do the law cannot do more than guarantee individuals the free and inoffensive use of their facilities. Excuse me, their faculties for physical, intellectual, and moral self-esteem. Right. So, what what does he say? Well, the law, if you and what he's talking about is a just law, right? Um, says the law cannot do more than guarantee you something, right? And that and that is the free and inoffensive uh, use of your faculties, basically to make yourself better off, right? That's that's what he's really saying. Now, notice that there's a couple points to be made here. One is um, this free and inoffensive use means that you're not invading my property rights. Okay? If you're doing something and it's invading my property rights, then it's your use of your property, but it's invading mine. So, for example, uh, again, if you wanted to produce electric power, 
uh, and as a consequence, uh, sulfur dioxide is going out into the atmosphere and causing acid rain and ruining my crops, then that's not inoffensive use, right? So the law needs to come in and establish what the property rights are. Now, again, in law and economics and public choice and public finance, I talk a good deal about those pollution, what we call externalities, where your action is imposing a cost on me, um, but you don't have to pay for it. Uh, so the solution is for the government to define property rights and say, okay, here's, here's somebody's got the property right. When we read Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, he's going to talk about laws as being the boundary of the sphere of free action. And it says that what happens is when your free action interferes with my free action, then the law's got to say, okay, here's who's got the, doesn't say it exactly this way, but here's who's got the property rights. So he's saying that the law can't do more than guarantee the use of your uh, faculties, your property, right, to make yourself better off. And, in, and, and you can't invade somebody else's property rights. So uh, the law can't do more than that. Um, now, uh, think about what also we, we talked about, what did we assume at the beginning? That you're rational, self-interested individuals trying to make yourself better off. Right? That's, that was one of the first things that we talked about when we were try, trying to develop a theory of people's actions. So we said that, so this is basically what Bastiat is saying, that you guys are going to try to make yourself better off, and the law can only guarantee you the right to do that. Uh, it can't guarantee outcomes. That's really what he's saying, right? The law can't guarantee uh, what the outcome is. Um, and again, um, uh, he's really saying a just law can basically only uh, uh, protect our liberties. Um, then he says, the uh, next thing he talked about is that um, one of the problems is the person who receives the benefit is not the person doing the stealing. The person who receives the benefit is not the one that's stealing. So what that entails is that we, we don't even recognize it, right? That is, uh, if you were to go to the bank, you go to County National Bank, and you pull out your gun, and you take the money from the cashier, pretty clear that somebody's doing some stealing going on here, right? But if the federal government taxed the people who are putting their money in the County National Bank, and took that money away and gave it to somebody else in the form of uh, Medicare uh, premium, then we wouldn't see that as stealing because we're not the ones doing the stealing. So Bastiat's point here is once the government is doing the stealing, um, we don't even recognize it as theft, right? Because we're not the ones doing, doing the stealing. And I mentioned earlier, if you had a change in the Social Security law, that said that you go to your neighbors, you have a list of your, what your neighbor owes in Social Security taxes, and you had to gather it up from them. And if they didn't give it to you, you pulled out a gun and said, oh, you're giving me the money, right? We'd say, wow, what, what allowed you to be able to go to your neighbor with your gun and take their money away, right? So it'd be obvious that the stealing was going on. But when we allow the government to steal stuff, then we don't see it as we don't see it as stealing. Um, then he points out that it's not the individual legislators that are causing the problem. He says that he's really attacking the system. Right? It's not the individual legislators. That is. Once the system's there, don't expect that electing another person to parliament or electing another person to Congress, they're not going to engage in legalized plunder. If that's the rules of the game, they're going to do it. And it's not their fault. It's the idea that you guys have accepted that this is the way we're going to run things. So if, it, if what happens is that you have uh, a government program 
it, that where it's taking from some folks and giving to another, then that program is going to be like what we call the commons, right? Um, when we put the white rhinoceros out, beginning of class, um, nobody owned the white rhinoceros. So what happened is you guys all grabbed it. Okay. Now, the same thing happens if you have a government program that says, oh, we're going to give away a billion dollars. Uh, what should your congressman do? Your congressman should go out and make sure that you get part of that billion dollars, right? Because if the congressman doesn't steal that white rhinoceros, somebody else's congressman is going to steal it. So it's not that there'll be a, there'll be less uh, less stuff given out. It's just that you folks, because you're saying, oh gee, I'm, you know, if Tim Wahlberg were to say, oh gee, I, I don't believe that the government ought to be involved in this thing. I'm not going to get anything from my constituents. It's not going to reduce the amount of stuff that got stolen. It's just going to make it go to somebody else rather than you. So Bastiat's point here is that. You are not going to solve the problem by somehow electing somebody else that's different, right? You're not just not electing the right person to the parliament that's going to affect things. You have to change the system. And how are you going to do that? Well, you got to persuade people uh, of the problems with legalized plunder. In the same way, notice that Mises was saying exactly the same thing, right? Mises said in liberalism that you have to get people's attention. You have to make sure they think it's important to deal with this. And he says that the only thing that's going to work is to win the battle of ideas, right? I mean, that's, that's what he says, that the, the, only, the only solution to this problem uh, is for people to uh, become classical liberals. That's the only way out of what he calls the social and economic chaos of the day, right? So uh, Bastiat's saying something very similar. He's saying, okay, the only way this is going to work is you guys to start to notice what's the problems with legalized plunder and decide you don't want your government engaging in legalized plunder. If the rules are the government can engage in it, then your person in parliament or your congressman is going to, uh, we shouldn't expect them uh, to not take advantage of it. Um, then he talks about uh, what um, uh, George Washington talked about. Um, that is to recognize that law is force, right? Law is about coercion. We said that, you know, Mises talked about this, he said all state action is human action. That is, if we give the uh, Department of Environmental Quality uh, power over something, you're really giving an individual power to coerce someone else. Whoever, the, whoever has been hired by the Department of Environmental Quality can go out there and tell this farmer whether they can put drain tile in or not. Uh, Bastiat is saying the same thing here. That is, law is about forcing you to do stuff. If you uh, were going to do it anyway, uh, we don't need the law. Or if you weren't going to do it anyway, uh, we don't need the law to tell you that you can't do it. That what law is really about is about coercion. And we want to have that, right? Because we want to keep you from interfering in my property rights. We, we, need, we need government as a force to protect property rights. But if we say that if we say that the purpose of the law is to provide free health care for everybody, okay, that how can that happen? The only way it can do that is to coerce you to say you're going to give your money to me so that I can give it to somebody else so that they can go buy uh, their 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 health care services. OK, so uh, just realize that what is what is government about? It's about coercion. And that's what what uh, um, George Washington said in this farewell address. Right. Um, but. We want to have that, just like Mises says that classical liberals are not anarchists. You need government, but you need to have it limited to protection of uh, life, liberty, and property. Um, then he says um, that a condition of justice would be sufficient to cause the greatest possible progress and equality compatible with individual responsibility. Right? So he says that Okay, what does a just law do? 
it allows for progress and equality, right? The greatest amount of that, but consistent with individual responsibility. Again, foreshadowing um, both Mises and Hayek, but Hayek has a whole chapter on responsibility in, in Constitution of Liberty, which we'll read. So that the, he says, what, ha what happens is a just law, what, the, what, you know, what is justice about? We want to have it so that we have the greatest progress in equality consistent with individual responsibility. So when we read Mises' liberalism, one of the foundations of a liberalism is an inequality under, you know, inequality of income. You have equality under the law, but you have inequality of income. Bastiat's pretty well saying the same thing here. That is, uh, if you guys have individual responsibility to produce for other people, then you're going to get rewarded if you're very productive. And if you're not very productive, you're not going to get very much. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have inequality of income. But we want to have income as equal as possible, given what that you guys are acting according to your own plan. And you guys are uh, more when some people are more productive than others. So, again, Bastiat is really meaning equality under the law at this point. And he's also basically... Again, he, we, we've mentioned that he focuses on justice, but also at near the end of the book, you get more of his uh, discussion about how a government limited to the protection of life, liberty, and property is also going to be the one where you guys uh, have the most stuff, that it's going to create, uh, create the most wealth. And that's what he's talking about here. When he's talking about uh, the, a, a state of justice creates the most, the, you know, the most progress, um, he's really talking about uh, that the economy will, will, uh, will grow the most if you uh, have a government which is just, right, which has limited the protection of life, liberty, and property. Um, and, then, and then, you know, following up on this, he says the law can only equalize incomes by taking from one person and giving to another. So if you have the government out there how, the only way it can equalize income is to take from one person and give to another. That is to engage in legalized plunder. And we need to realize that. That is, we need to realize that if, uh, if you are a democratic socialist, you know, if you're running for president as a democratic socialist, and you say that I'm going to make it so that we're going to make the income more equal. The only way to do that is to steal, right? The only way to make it so that you have more stuff is for me to take it and from somebody else and give it to you. So again, will we recognize that as theft? Um, Best Jot says, you know, once the government engages in legalized plunder, you'll start to lose that sense of what's just and, un and unjust. Um, but he says, let's point out, the, the only, if, you're, if you're unhappy with income inequality, which there's a 29-year-old congresswoman uh, from New York State that is unhappy with the equality of income, right? She, she thinks that inequality of income is a bad thing, right? If you're going to make incomes more equal and you're going to do it using the government, the only way you can do that is to engage in legalized plunder, to steal from one person and give to another. That's the only way it can happen. So we sort of need to, to, uh, to think about that. And then he says, um, forced associations are, uh, are, are unjust. If I force you to join something. Uh, but... Voluntary associations are not unjust. So uh, the Rotary Club or the Elks Club or uh, the uh, Nature Conservancy or any of these things, these are all 
uh, just because you're not forced to do this. And so um, what, what his, his point here is that the, there's a difference between the government providing aid to people uh, and, the, um, and voluntary associations providing aid to people. Um, you'll notice that in the city of Hillsdale, uh, you'll notice that, let's say somebody, uh, their, their child uh, gets some disease and uh, it's going to cost a bunch of money to have them at the hospital or whatever. Guarantee you, the front page of the Hillsdale Daily News will say, uh, well, the Elks Club is raising money for this couple and they're going to have a dinner and it's going to be on Wednesday and, you know, all the proceeds will go to the family or the, or the Rotary Club will do that or, or whatever. Some church will, there will always be some voluntary association that's out there that's helping uh, people who are in trouble. Why? Because we're a small town uh, and if this were New York City, uh, or this were the city of Chicago, probably today, uh, if someone uh, had some unfortunate uh, accident happen, you wouldn't have headlines in the Chicago Tribune. Oh, and by the way, the Chicago Rotary Club is having a benefit dinner for them. Uh, everybody show up, right? Um, so what, what, you know, Best Jot's saying is that how are we supposed to take care of the poor, right? How are we supposed to take care of those people that aren't doing very well? And the answer is, you should do it through voluntary association. Um, in fact, uh, there's a, um, I, I've talked about this earlier, that if you, um, if you Google uh, Gary Wolf from Scrooge, you'll get my article that I wrote uh, over Christmas one time about uh, when, when uh, a Christmas Carol, when they come to Scrooge and they ask them to help out with uh, poor people, he says, are there no poor houses? And he goes on with this whole two paragraph uh, discussion about, hey, you told me the, 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 the government's supposed to take care of these people, right? You taxed me and the government's supposed to take care of these people. Um, so what do we think today? We think the exact same thing, right? that if the town of paradise burns down, we don't say, oh gee, here's this poor person, their house burnt down, their restaurant burnt down, uh, they don't have any income right now, uh, they had to lay off their employees, uh, and et cetera, and maybe we should send some a little bit of money, right? We don't think that. We think that, oh my gosh, FEMA should be there, right? And if the federal government doesn't give California a whole bunch of money to take care of this, then it must be because Donald Trump is irritated with the governor of California uh, because they're too much on the left, right? We don't say, oh my gosh, we should have been taking care of that. Um, but there's a, a, a just a couple articles I'm going to read to you from. Um, one is by Bert Folsom and... Uh, who taught here for a number of years. Um, he retired maybe two, three years ago. Uh, but he wrote a piece uh, called The Difference Between a Fire and a Flood, and he wrote it in 1997. Now, there's always disasters going on, right? Um, next year, there'll be a disaster. You know, next month, there'll probably be a disaster somewhere. So this particular disaster was in 1997, there was these huge floods uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, North Dakota. Um, and so he's writing about this. He says, what are the differences between these two natural disasters? The North Dakota flood of April 1997 and the Michigan fire of September of 1881. Okay? The first difference is that bad as the flood on the Red River was, the Michigan fire exacted a much greater toll. Um, the, the most that the fire swept through the, the thumb area is a killing almost 300 people and destroying over 1 million acres of timberland. Okay, so we didn't see that 300 people or excuse me, 200 people were killed in paradise, right? It's like 20 or something. So, uh, we what th this fire in, in Michigan in 1881 was pretty big deal, right? A million acres, 200 people killed. Um, and he says that, um, 
millions of dollars of property in the Michigan counties of Huron, Tuscola, Sanilac, and Lapeer, if you know Michigan at all. A second difference may be seen in the prevailing attitudes towards private charity and the role of government. Um, uh, much of the spotlight, this is on the, on the uh, North Dakota flood, um, much of the spotlight focused on high-profile politicians and other people's tax money they were generously offering to the victims. President Clinton, Bill, not Hillary, um, President Clinton and four cabinet secretaries flew to Grand Forks to announce a policy uh, rarely adopted in federal relief efforts, Washington would pay 100% of the immediate emergency work, not the mere 75% it had paid in the past. Um, but for Michiganians in 1881, um, they saw it as their personal responsibility to help their federal citizens in need. Um, it, uh, the, uh, in fact, the Michigan fire became the first disaster relief effort of Clara Barton and her newly formed American Red Cross. Uh, as smoke billowed eastward across the nation, Barton's hometown of Dansville, New York, became a focal point of relief. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, Michiganians were prepared to organize all relief voluntarily within the state. In a previous fire in 1871, 3,000 Michigan families were left homeless. Governor Henry Baldwin personally organized the relief efforts and gave out of his own pockets the equivalent of $3 million in today's, uh, today's dollars. Few, if any, thought it necessary to create a federal relief bureaucracy. Um, why did so many Americans 100 years ago reject federal aid and assist on personal charity? Um, Horatio Bunce, a farmer philosopher of the 1800s, spoke for most citizens when he argued that federal aid to disaster victims was not only unconstitutional, but also uncharitable. If you are at liberty to give to any and everything which you may believe or profess believe is a charity, and to any amount you may think proper, he told his congressman, you will very easily perceive what a wide door this would open for fraud and corruption and favoritism on the one hand and robbing people on the other. So, Bert Folsom's point is, 1881, we weren't thinking about, about having the government take care of things. We were supposed to. Let me just give you a, a brief... Uh, other disaster uh, about the same time. Anybody from Chicago here? Really? Anybody from Chicago? Okay, it's all in the 10 o'clock class. Um, so, uh, 1871, Chicago fire. What happened? Uh, basically, it burnt down the city of Chicago. Um, 300 people were killed. Uh, over 17,000 buildings covering almost three and a half square miles uh, were, were burnt down. Roughly a, a third of the city in, lay in ruins, and an equal proportion of the population uh, was, uh, was homeless. Um, so what happened? There was no federal emergency management agency back then, no Illinois emergency management either. There was also little appetite for victimhood and no time to complain. Even before the bricks stopped smoking, the people of Chicago vowed to, vowed to come back uh, bigger and, and better than before. Um, so uh, uh, most of the wharfs uh, and mills along the Chicago River survived, and so these industries uh, uh, kept the city's finances stable and continued to employ people. Um, and it says uh, banks rallied quickly. Uh, within 48 hours, the fire's end. 12 of the 29 banks that had been burned to the ground were operating in makeshift facilities. Um, Henry Greham, a local banker, sent letters to investment bankers all over the globe touting Chicago's great location and opportunities for anyone who would bet on the people of the city. Chicago did not have a public library before the Great Fire, but book donations collected in England became part of Chicago's first free public library, which opened its doors on January 1, 1873. Queen Victoria, Benjamin Disraeli, John Stuart Mill, and Charles Darwin led that effort on behalf of the people of Chicago. By 1880, Chicago's population reached half a million, so larger than it was before. A flood of talented architects were attracted to Chicago by the post-fire construction opportunities, uh, and many stayed on. Um, by 1890, only 20 years after the fire, Chicago passed the one million mark in population, becoming the second biggest city in America. The population had more than tripled since the Windy City's dar darkest nights. So uh, the, the point here is that 
it was, he says, it, what made it possible was American ingenuity, optimism, spirit, character, and capitalism itself. That is, 1871, Chicago didn't look towards <coughs> FEMA, right? Didn't look towards the government to take care of things. And, and it worked out. There's a, uh, a, a good book called uh, The Tragedy of American Compassion. And what it is is a discussion. It's a book about what happened uh, in this era that we were talking about, the late 19th century. What happened was people looked towards uh, individual responsibility and looked towards charity to take care of people. Um, and, but as we, they proceeded in time, uh, let's uh, beginning with uh, the New Deal. As you work through that, what happened was people began to think that it was their it was it wasn't their responsibility to take care of people. It was the government's responsibility. So that uh, probably few of us uh, got together with anybody and said, "Hey, maybe we should uh, you know help some people out that were uh, in these uh, fires in uh, in Paradise or Santa Rosa or Redding, California. All these big fires they've been having." Now, the, the uh, tragedy of American passion basically says that we've, we become less compassionate once we think the government ought to be providing the compassion. Now, America is still the most compassionate of any country in the world, uh, pretty much by far. Uh, why is that? Because we still believe in market capitalism, right? And we still, uh, there are still some folks that uh, believe that it's not the role of government to take care of everybody. Uh, it is our role. So if you're going to believe in market capitalism, if you're going to believe a classical liberal, uh, if you're going to believe in a government being just, if it's uh, restricted to the protection of life, liberty, and property, then it, it is your responsibility to take care of other people. Um, do we, 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 it is required a sense of capitalists or classical liberals. If the government isn't going to help the poor people, right? They're not going to all of a sudden magically, uh, you know, be uh, anointed and all of a sudden have money. That's not what's going to happen. We're going to have to take care of them. And if you look to the Soviet Union, one of the things that happened in the Soviet Union is there was almost no compassion in the Soviet Union. There was almost no uh, charitable contributions in the Soviet Union. Why is that? Because you thought the it was the government's role to do everything. So uh, if you look at democratic socialism, is that a reliance on the government taking stuff and giving it to somebody else, relying on legalized plunder? Uh, and what Bastiat would argue is that's not, uh, th that's not what you ought to be doing. What you ought to be doing is uh, taking, care of, uh, taking care of the poor uh, yourself. Um, and then lastly, uh, Bastrat brings up pretty much what Mises said. Um, he's talking about education. And he says, uh, being against government enforcement of education doesn't mean you're against education. Right. So uh, if you're against government enforced education, That doesn't mean that you're against education. Now, notice how much this looks like uh, Mises, in the sense that Mises said that if you are against a policy because you believe that its unintended consequences are going to be harmful, then you're going to be branded an enemy of the people. So, if you and, and if you no, notice today, if you listen to any politicians. If you listen to somebody that's supported by the Michigan Education Association or the National Education Association, what are they going to say? Oh, you need, you don't care about the children, right? If you, were to, if you were to get up there, and I was on the State Board of Education in Michigan for six years, uh, and I would say things like, oh, maybe we ought to have the, the education being provided in the same way that uh, we provide everything else, right? That is through the market process. Why? Why? Maybe we shouldn't uh, rely on government to be producing this stuff. Well, of course, I didn't get elected to the State Board of Education, even though it's an elected uh, position. Um, 
Dick DeVos had been a member of the of the uh, he had been elected to the state board, and two years into his term, the um, his father got sick, and so he ended up having to take over the company and didn't have time to be on the state board. So uh, I was appointed uh, to fulfill the last six years of uh, his term. But you can imagine what did they see me as? They saw me as against education, right? Then you know I would read to them from Bastiat and exactly what he said and. Uh, you know, and I would read to them from Mises, and uh, but uh, that wasn't uh, what they expected to hear, right? Um, and so, uh, again, just like Mises says, if you're against something because you recognize the unintended consequences, you have to be aware that people are going to attack you and say you don't really want to help people. Bastiat saying the same thing in 1850, he's saying, um, uh, being against government and forced education does not mean uh, you're against education. Listen to people running for Congress or people running for, particularly people running for statewide office, running for governor. Um, what will they talk about? They'll talk about the need for more money for education, right? Then what does more money for education really mean? It really means that taking your tax dollars to provide for government enforced education, where the government says, Here's what's to be produced. Here's how it's to be produced. Here's where you have to go to get uh, to get the services. All right. So for uh, Friday, we will finish uh, the law by Friday. Um, Wednesday again is the exam. Don't forget. Um, make sure that you have looked in the in box in the Wolfram folder. Looked at the old exams. Don't walk in there for the first time that you've decided to answer this question being when you're looking at it in front of you because you're not going to have time. You're going to be constrained. Both midterms will be constrained for time, not the final, but both midterms. So come in. There's going to be a question on foundations of liberalism, right? There's going to be a demand and supply curve one just as we talked about last night. So make sure that you come in prepared for the exam, all right? And again, I should be around most of tomorrow and 